ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمدا عبد الله تعالى ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى اله واصحابه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وقال تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال تعالى ايضا لقد كان لكم في رسول الله اسوه حسنه لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الاخر وذكر الله كثيرا وقال تعالى ايضا قل ان كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم والله غفور رحيم صدق الله العظيم All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. May the choicest of his blessings and salutations be upon our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. O children of Adam, first and foremost I enjoin upon myself and then all of you all who have come here to adopt a life of taqwa for it is only through a life of taqwa can a believer attain success in this world as well as the hereafter may allah the almighty make us all from the people of taqwa my dear respected elders and brothers in islam today's khutbah insha allah ta'ala is going to evolve around the definition of sunnah around the de- definition of uh, the sunnah of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the more we study about our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the more love comes in our hearts towards him because this love towards rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very closely linked to iman and why we say this is because of the hadith which is recorded in bukhari Umar radiyallahu an he once goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tells him ya Rasulullah i love you more than anything in this world except for myself he goes and informs Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ya Rasulullah i love you more than anything in this world except for myself Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says no ya Umar you have to love me even more than your own self allahu akbar another hadith goes along the lines of these words la yu'minu ahadukum hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa waladihi wa an-nas ajma'in aw kama qala alayhi as-salatu was salam rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that none of you have truly brought in iman none of you have truly brought in iman until and unless you love me more than your parents more than your own children and more than any human being more than all of humanity so umar radiyallahu an coming back to the main hadith the minute rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
said that, he immediately changed his statement to say, Ya Rasulullah, if that is the case, then I love you even more than myself. Allahu Akbar. Now a question could arise as to how or why did Umar radiallahu an immediately change his statement. And the best explanation in regard to that is the explanation of Al-Imam Al-Khattabi rahimahullah who says that hub, that love is divided into two. You have two types of love. Hub ikhtiyari and hub tabi'i. Two types of love. Hub tabi'i and hub ikhtiyari. Now what is hub tabi'i? Hub tabi'i is that naturally ingrained love that all of us have for our own selves. Say for example, none of us would climb to the third or the fourth floor of a high rise building and then jump off the building. Why? Because we love our own selves. We value our lives. This is hub tabi'i, a naturally ingrained love, with, uh, ingrained love within us. But as for hub ikhtiyari, it is a love that comes about due to some type of a reason. Just as how all of us love our own parents. We love our parents because we know what our parents have done for us. That is the reason we love them. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is highlighting in the hadith that Ya Umar radiallahu an, what is required from you is hub ikhtiyari. You have to choose to love me. Because the minute you love me, you will be saved from the blazing inferno of Jahannam. You will be saved from the blazing fire of hell. That love, that pure love that you have for me will be a means of salvation for you from Jahannam. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, that is why Umar radiallahu an immediately changes his statement. Because he knows the minute he changes his statement, that love will become a result for him to be saved from the fire of Jahannam. Allahu Akbar. And likewise, if you look at the ayah that I recited in the beginning, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inform your ummah, say, if you love me, if you love Allah, if you love Allah, إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي then follow me. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, if you love Allah, then follow me. Yuhbibukum Allah. In return, Allah the Almighty will love you. Wa yaghfir lakum zunubakum. And He will forgive all of your sins. Wallahu ghafoorur rahim. Indeed, Allah the Almighty is the most forgiving, the most merciful. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, Based on this hadith and other ayat too, we come to a conclusion that the love of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is closely linked to Iman. It's very closely linked to Iman. Just as how Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah is reported to have said that there is not a believer on the face of this earth except that in his heart there will be an atom's weight of pure love towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much to the extent that even if one of his close relatives, one of his beloved ones, one of his friends were to insult Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would not be able to bear it. He would separate himself from that relative. He would move away from that friend. And it even might go to an extent that he might cut his relationship with that individual. For if he does not have these kind of feelings in his heart, he is not a true believer. Allahu Akbar. And that is why we see Imam Ibn al-Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah, he, mentioned, he mentions in his book, Durar al-Kamina, that once an incident took place, it went down in history. There was once a Mongolian king. There was once a Mongolian king who arranged for a feast. He arranged for a feast and called all of his followers. Most of them were Christians. And one of them, a Christian scholar, if you will, or a father or a priest, was amongst them. While they were feasting, this priest gets up and he starts to insult our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He starts to insult Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now there was a hunting dog. A hunting dog who was tied up in the corner of that chamber. The minute he started insulting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
that dog, a humongous, vicious, wild dog, started barking and trying to leap towards that man. It, it started jumping and trying to break free from its chain. All of the people were worried. And then some of them said, you know what, you better keep quiet because I think the dog is disturbed due to your statement. The Christian priest, he says, you know, it's not about my statement. It's because I'm talking so nice. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm giving a good presentation. I'm moving my arms and I'm talking to you all so nicely. That is perhaps disturbing the dog. Please ask the, sec- the forces to take the dog inside. So the king's forces, they come and they take the dog, drag the dog away from that chamber to another location where they tie up the dog. Now the priest goes on insulting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very harsh words. Taunting our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And do you know what happens? Imam Ibn Hajar rahimahullah mentions that the dog that is now tied up in that very corner, it breaks free from its chains, comes rushing at the man and jumps straight for his throat and kills that man. Kills that Christian father then and there. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, the incident does not end there. All of those Mongolians who witnessed that incident, who witnessed that scene, 40,000 of them immediately embraced Islam. Because they realized that this is the value, this is the dignity of our Master Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that even an animal will not bear that he be insulted Allahu Akbar. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, it is only fair that we study about him, study about his life so that our heart will be filled with pure love towards him. So we will be discussing about what is Sunnah. Sunnah is an Arabic term. It has a lexical or a linguistic definition and it also has a technical shari'i definition to it. Its lexical or linguistic definition, translation is path. Sunnah translates itself to path. So you would say the path of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But as for its shari'i or its technical definition, it divides itself into four categories. Four categories. Category number, number one, Sunnah Qawliya. We have something known as Sunnah Qawliya. Let me mention the four categories. Sunnah Qawliya, Sunnah Fi'liya, Sunnah Taqririya, and then we have something known as Sunnah Tarkiya, which many people are not aware of. Four categories. Once again, Sunnah Qawliya, Sunnah Fi'liya, Sunnah Taqririya, and Sunnah Tarkiya. Now let's break it down and discuss each category. Sunnah Qawliya, is that category which entails all of the statements of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have uttered, that falls into that category, Sunnah Qawliya. And that category, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, Allah the Almighty brought about scholars, Scholars, the likes of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, Imam Muslim rahimahullah, Imam Abu Dawood rahimahullah, Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah, Imam Ibn Majah rahimahullah, Imam Al-Nasai rahimahullah, Imam Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani rahimahullah, and the likes of them, the muhaddithun, to protect the ahadith of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, there is a complete science which many of us are not aware. There is a complete science devoted to protecting the ahadith of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other words, in regard to the authenticity of the ahadith, no one can come about and say, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that the sky is red or the sky is purple. The minute somebody comes about with a fabricated a hadith or a hadith, the first question that will be posed to him is, give me your narrators. From where did you hear this hadith from? And that is why we are known as the Ummah of the Sanad. What is Sanad? Sanad translates to the chain of narrators. We are the nation of the chain of narrators. 
Because all of these scholars, the names that I mentioned, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, they had photographic memory. Not only had they memorized huge numbers of a hadith of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had even memorized the chains of narrators. They had even memorized the biography of each and every narrator. They would tell you where is this narrator from, from which city, who are his parents, who are his teachers, who are his students. Perhaps he was accused of lying, he was accused of stealing, he was accused of this, that. Then we cannot accept, accept a hadith from him. Like this, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, these scholars protected the ahadith of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me give you an instance in the life of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, we know he was a giant. He was a scholar in ahadith. He once traveled to a particular city. And the scholars of that city, they wanted to test the knowledge of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. They wanted to test the prowess of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. The minute he enters that city, he was expecting a warm welcome. But ten scholars come up to him and say, O oh Bukhari, O oh Imam al-Bukhari, you are the great Imam. We wish to test you. We wish to test your knowledge. Because you have become the muhaddis of the era. We want to test your knowledge. Now these ten scholars had already planned to put forward, each scholar is going to put forward 10 ahadith. Each scholar was to put forward 10 ahadith. But the, 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 the puzzle there was, is that, that, I mean, all 10 of these ahadith are not going to be without any strings attached, but rather each hadith was jumbled. In other words, the text of the hadith was jumbled and mixed up with the narrators of another hadith. Likewise, all ten ahadith were jumbled. Each one of them brought about ten ahadith. So equals to hundred ahadith were put forward to Imam Bukhari rahimahullah. So each scholar came forward and said, here are my ten ahadith. And he narrates his ten ahadith. But in reality, they have been jumbled and mixed up. So each time he finished narrating a hadith and asked Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, do you know of this hadith? Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, he replies, no, I have never heard of this hadith. Next hadith, no, I have never heard of this hadith. All hundred ahadith, the jumbled up ahadith passed by. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah's reply for each hadith was, no, I have not heard of this hadith. So after all of the hundred ahadith, these scholars ask Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, you call yourself a scholar, you call yourself a muhaddith, but you don't know these ahadith that we put forward in front of you. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah now gets up and he says, scholar number one, you said this hadith, hadith number one. He gives the jumbled version. He says, this is your version, this is the wrong version, and then he goes on to give the correct version. Hadith number one, hadith number two, hadith number three, all hundred ahadith, he gives them the jumbled up version, which they had put forward to him then and there. He had memorized it then and there by listening, and not only that, right after giving them the jumbled up version, he corrected them by giving them the correct version. Allahu Akbar. All of these ten scholars were astounded. They were flabbergasted by the knowledge and the memory of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. So coming back to the main discussion, Allah the Almighty, He used scholars, the likes of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, to protect that category of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because today we have individuals popping up and saying, you know, we only have to follow the Qur'an. We only have to follow the Qur'an. We cannot follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because we do not know about the authenticity of the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar. How are those individuals going to pray salah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the noble Qur'an, وَأَقِيمُ salah. It is a concise command. Offer your salah. But what about how are you to offer your salah? 
how are you to pray? All of that comes from the hadith of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And likewise we have something known as mutawatir. Mutawatir narrations of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where the number, say for example, let me explain, let me make it clear to you all. Say if I were to say that this pulpit is gold in color. If I were to say that this pulpit is gold in color, how many of you all are witnessing that statement? Say a hundred of you all, two hundred of you all, all of you all witness that I said that this pulpit is gold in color. Tomorrow, if all two hundred of you all go and inform someone that so and so Shaykh, he said that the pulpit is gold in color, can I deny that? Or can anybody deny that? Two hundred people affirming the fact Affirming my statement, can I deny it? Likewise, there are many ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where the number of narrators are so huge that there is no way you can deny that there is a possibility that it could be a fabricated hadith. Allahu Akbar. That is known as the mutawatir hadith of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now moving on to the next category, Sunnah Fi'liya. The, this category, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, is a category which entails all of the actions of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. For example, our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he grew a beard. That is one of his actions. Likewise, there is a hadith where he commands us to grow our beard. So this, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, has double em- emphasis. Because he has said it, and likewise he did it. It is from his action. So it's clear, we do not have to spend much time in that particular category. We move on to Sunnah Taqririya. This category entails all of the approval and the sanction of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perhaps he did not do it. Because if he did it, it would go into the category of his actions. Perhaps he did not give out an explicit statement in regard to it. Because if he had done that, it would have gone to the first category, Sunnah Qawliya. Now let me give you an incident to explain this third category, Sunnah Taqririya. Once, Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu an and Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, both of them accompany Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to one of his wife's houses. If I'm not mistaken, it was the house of Maymuna radiallahu anha. Now when they go there, they sit down to partake a meal. And a dish is placed in, fr- in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was roasted meat. It was roasted meat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam outstretches his hand to partake of that dish. Now there was a murmur from behind. The women were talking amongst themselves. And they said, inform Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inform Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they informed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulullah, that dish is roasted lizard meat. Roasted lizard meat. It is a type of a reptile. Even here in our country, the outskirts of Colombo, perhaps, people consume it. It is a type of an iguana. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the minute he found out that it is roasted lizard meat, he withdrew his hand. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, who was there, now that was his favorite dish. He was Sayyidullah al-Maslul, the drawn sword of Allah. Roasted lizard meat, he liked it. He asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately, Ya Rasulullah, a haramun huwa? Is it haram? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replies, No, it is not haram, but me and my tribe, me and my tribe, my people, we aren't used to eating this type of a meat. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, he pulls the dish to himself and whacks the whole dish. He polishes the whole dish in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. While Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was observing it. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. Al-amru bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. Enjoining good and forbidding evil is a responsibility upon this ummah. And on a, gra- on a greater scale upon our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if something which was prohibited, something which is haram, happening in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
cannot keep quiet about it. He would have had to stop Khalid radiallahu anh. But his mere silence and keeping quiet about it signifies that he approves of it. This is known as Sunnah Taqririya. From the approvals of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the things that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sanctioned. We move on to the final category, Sunnah Tarkiya. This, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, is a category which entails all that which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left. And just because our master, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, left it, we also leave it even though there may be a need towards that action. Let me give you an example as examples bring about clarity. If you were to take the issue of Adhan, calling people for Salah. Now five times a day we have Adhan to call people to the Masjid. Now what about Salatul Eid? Salatul Eid? What about the Salatul Khusuf? Salatul Khusuf? We have prayers for the eclipses, lunar eclipse, solar eclipse. There is a need, even Salatul Eid, there is a need to inform the people to come to the masjid. There is a need. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not call out Adhan for Salatul Eid. And because our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left it, we also leave it even though there is a need. These are the four categories which make up the shari'i definition of sunnah. And why we discuss about this today, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, is to give us an insight into what exactly is sunnah. For the more we study about our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the more our heart fills with love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The more we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the more we love Allah jalla wa az. Because the levels of the love of Allah and the love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are very, very closely linked. If you do not love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sincerely, purely, free of all innovation, you do not love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the best way of proving that we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, the best way to prove that you love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is by emulating Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is by following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is by bringing his sunnah into our lives for only then can we attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. Now let me mention an incident which took place during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This narration is recorded in the collection of authentic narrations of Imam Albani rahimahullah. If I'm not mistaken, it was during the battle of Uhud. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was straightening the rows the sufuf, the rows in the battlefield. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was straightening the rows in the battlefield. He was straightening the rows using a particular stick of his. He had a staff, a stick that he was using. So whilst he was straightening the rows, there was one sahabi. One sahabi, if I'm not mistaken, his name was Sa'ad radiallahu an. He was a bit in forward. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to him and tells him, go back, move back a bit. But perhaps he did not understand Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lightly touched him with his stick to go back so that the rows will be straight. That sahabi radiallahu an seized the, the opportunity and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you hurt me. You hurt me with your stick. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he was an individual full of justice, he immediately said, is that so? Then you can take retaliation because I do not want to be held accountable on the day of Qiyamah. The incident goes along the lines of these words. He gives the stick to that sahabi radiallahu an, so that he may hit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam back and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam removed the dress that he was wearing because that sahabi was also bare-bodied whilst Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam touched him with the stick. 
the minute Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pulled up his dress, this sahabi radiallahu an runs to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and hugs Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and kisses Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his hip. And then he says, Ya Rasulullah, I did this solely to kiss you, Ya Rasulullah, because I feel that this battle may be my last battle and I wanted my skin to touch your skin. Allahu Akbar. Look at the love that the Sahaba, Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhim ajma'een, had for our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another narration of Zayd radiallahu an, he was taken captured by the Quraysh. Abu Sufyan goes up to him. They are about to kill him. And Abu Sufyan, before he embraces Islam, this is, he asks that Sahabi radiallahu an, Ya Zayd, do you wish that if I set you free now, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam be put in your place? Zayd radiallahu anhu replies, No, never. I cannot even bear that I sit home comfortably with my family whilst even a thorn, even a thorn pricking my master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will not be able to bear it. Abu Sufyan was astounded. He says, I have never ever seen a human being love another human being the way the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, it is upon us to study the life of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because at the end of the day, we human beings, we are created in a manner that we need a role model in front of us to follow. Allah the Almighty says in the Noble Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا For y'all, fi Rasulillah, in the Messenger of Allah is a beautiful role model. A beautiful role model. But sadly today, all of us, we suffer complexes to look like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have taken role models who lead us towards wise. We have taken role models who lead us to transgression. We have taken role models who lead us to sin. Whilst we should be studying about the life of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we should be taking the Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam as our role models. We should be taking the Sahaba ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi majma'een as our role models. Because this is the golden legacy that Islam has left behind for us. Today we know the favorite foods of athletes, of sportsmen. We know that this cricketer likes pasta and that sportsman likes noodles. We know that this person likes spaghetti. We know the favorite colors of all of these actors and actresses. We know what they wear. We know their biographies. We know about their tweets. We know where they live. We know all of this. But if we were to talk about the golden history of Islam, we are clueless. We are clueless. If we talk about the Sahaba, Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhi majma'een, we are clueless. Because we haven't studied about those great personalities. We haven't made them our role models. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that you will be with the ones you love on the day of Qiyamah. Do we wish to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of Qiyamah? Then emulate his lifestyle. Then follow him. You want to be with the Sahaba Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi majma'een and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then bring their lives as your lives, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. For it is only through that can we hope to stand confidently on the day of Qiyamah so that we will be all part of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah the Almighty forgive all of our sins and may He accept all of our good deeds and may He fill our hearts with pure love for our Master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May He fill our hearts with ardent desire to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May He fill our hearts with ardent desire to emulate the lifestyle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may he unite all of us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
May he help us stay away from all of the evil innovations that are taking place today. May he accept all of our deeds. Wa akhir da'waya anilhamdulillahi rabbi.